Hey there, day walkers and fellow travelers of the night. Welcome back to another episode of Seek a Night, where we are going to open some Crow City of Angels trading cards. I found these for like 20 bucks each on eBay, which is really cool. I was looking for the original Crow movie trading cards. Unfortunately, those for sealed boxes go for like four or $500, which is not really a bad price, considering it's a bunch of great shots of Brandon Lee in the first film uh, directed by Alex Proyas, but it was just way out of our budget. So when I saw these for like 20 bucks and like $5 each to ship them, I figured we'll just do this because all I really want to do is talk about the Crow franchise. And we've actually unboxed Crow City of Angels cards before on this channel many years ago. And we talked about the Tim Pope cut of this film. Uh, I want to get a little bit more into that in this episode and show off some of the cards and just kind of go through things. Talk about the Crow franchise in general from comics to movies, TV show, all that stuff and the upcoming remake. So that's what we're going to do today. So first up, we're going to start with this box here since it's already kind of half opened uh it was sealed sealed when it came in um but then it was uh this kind of got caught on some tape so when we pulled it out of the box it kind of ripped open so that's okay the boxes are you know it's still technically a new box and this was from kitchen sink press during this time in the 90s they had the rights to the crow for distribution i believe for comics and other things and they actually made a lot of stuff like check this out on the back of this box they show off t-shirts rings pins mugs hats lighters all this stuff was for sale because before this sequel came out it was a big deal to the people who were fans of the first film because obviously you know everyone that saw the first film not everyone but a lot of people that did really loved that film and it resonated with them and it certainly resonated with us although that's pre-aneurysm and i don't remember all of it still it resonated with us so much so that three of my alters or our alters actually got their names from this film, believe it or not. So we're going to talk about that too on a personal level because, you know, usually I like to add a personal touch to videos when it's necessary. And in this case, it very much is so. Uh, this was something I've learned more recently. So I figured this would be a good way to talk about that as well as the franchise. But I've always liked this logo with the bones of the crow. That's really, really cool. And then these are the packs and you get a lot in here. I mean, no kidding, I think we're going to get a full set of the base cards in one box, <laughs> most likely. Uh, I don't see why we wouldn't. And then uh, we're also going to get probably a full set of the tattoos, because there's a tattoo, a temporary tattoo, in every pack of these cards. Um, and then there's also chromium cards, they call them. Like, they spell out the word crow and put meum at the end of them. Um, so you can see here, there's 90 card set. 10 crow tattoos, like I said, one in every pack, I believe. Uh, 10 embossed Legends of the Crow, so the le you know the embossed cards, um, and then the chromium cards. And we do have a lot of these already, so there's a chance that you know we're going to just see all duplicates today. But if you didn't watch our previous video, I don't even know if it's still up on the channel, honestly. <laughs> um, but we'll you know you'll see a full set here for sure. And then there's an Ultra Chase card that is one in every like I don't know three or four hundred packs maybe. So I don't know if we'll get that. We didn't get it before, but it's a, a replica of the painting that Sarah makes in the movie, which is very pivotal to the plot of the film. So we got our packs here. We're just going to start opening them and talking about the franchise. And we'll start with the first one because obviously it makes sense too. The first film was amazing, uh, is amazing. It's coming out on 4K Blu-ray very, very soon in May 7th. So make sure you, you know, pre-order it i'll put a link down below or if you're watching this afterwards make sure you buy it if you're a crow fan and that i'm glad because now that this remake's coming out even though it doesn't look like a great remake to me it looks like we're going to get a lot of reissued graphic novels and, and things are going to come back into print at least for a little while and that's cool for those of us fans that missed out on certain things so hopefully they re-release the soundtracks too which i know they've been doing on vinyl but i'd love to see them get re-released digitally as well so all right so our first crow tattoo like I said, there's one of these in every pack. Awesome. With Ash there um, and the bird down at the bottom. So this is actually Thomas Jane. <laughs> this is the Punisher himself. Uh, the guy who played the Punisher in the John Travolta movie as well. Um, so yeah, he has a, a, a role in here, a small role, where he plays one of the villains that kills this version of the Crow, who I liked vincent as the crow i think he did a good job um i think the look of the film's amazing it doesn't match the first film you know tying back to the first film i know that's where our conversation is starting the first film alex proyez had a really great look added a lot of style to the movie and if you watch the behind the scenes featurettes of the first movie they explain 
that the, him and the art director and the set director, they all had these plans to try to capture the spirit of James O'Barr's comic while also adding elements of their own to it. And it really was a nice blend of like a James O'Barr story and an Alex Proyas, you know, story. Uh, John Shirley, who wrote the script and, uh, and then what Brandon brought to the role and everyone brought to the role, Michael Wincott and everybody. So yeah, just really cool um, how much style that they focused on when making that first film. Um, that was like their big inspiration was having the book ha or having the movie, you know, feel like a comic book in a way, but still doing their own thing. So that's one of the things I liked about the second one here is that I think Tim Pope, who directed it, he also did a good job of trying to capture this fantasy slash comic book world of James Obar's while adding in his own style as a director of music videos for like The Cure and Depeche Mode, I believe. And he's done a lot of great bands. He did their music videos for them. So having like that kind of rock and roll and music background, I think he was a good choice for a director of this film. The sad thing is that this movie got butchered in editing and there was a lot of reshoots done because Harvey Weinstein didn't like the first cut because it was different in a way to what the first film was, which is what they were going for. David Goyer wrote this film. Um, he's, you know, in recent years has written Man of Steel and, you know, uh, uh, Batman v Superman, all that stuff. Uh, and the Dark Knight movies with Christopher Nolan. So he's a great writer and uh, the Blade movies he later did. So very talented dude, but um, yeah, for some reason, they just, you know, they didn't like that cut of the film. And and it, I hear that it's because it was different and it wasn't just all action. There was like a great love story to it. And they were trying to capture that because that's what The Crow is, is that it's like this dark love story in the comics. And so they, uh, they were bummed, <laughs> you know, that their movie wasn't appreciated and it got butchered. So they're is a you know like i said in the previous video we did of this there is a, a group of fans out there that are hardcore in spreading the word on a tim pope cut of this film and i don't know if we'll ever see it now that they're doing a remake i would love for them to revisit that find that footage and release like a, a, a specific cut of this film but i think it's been too many years and, and and probably not a lot of interest besides just the hardcore fans and and uh and that's a real shame because i would still love to see this film um the original me, before our, our aneurysm, a great shot of Iggy Pop there. Um, the original me, uh, they were all big fans of The Crow. And when the first film came out, this is, like I said, something I've been learning recently uh, through therapy and stuff, and uh, where they're talking about um, that when they were younger, the first Crow really resonated with all of them. And then they heard the second Crow was coming out, and they all got excited. And when the first Crow released on VHS and Laserdisc, there was a teaser trailer that said the Crow City of Angels will be releasing in 1996, you know, a couple years later. And it showed the headstone or tombstone of someone named Michael Corvin. Uh, and it was voiced over by Sarah as an adult. So it seems like that was always going to be the premise was Sarah from the first film growing up, going to Los Angeles and, you know, meeting another Crow, basically. Um, so Michael Corvin was that character's name. And then they cast Vincent Perez. And then right before, you know, filming and all that stuff. Wow, we got the same three tattoos in a row. Um, right before filming, they changed the character's name to Ash. Um, so, or during the script process, they changed it to Ash. So those names, Michael, Ash, and Vincent, are coincidentally, not coincidentally, because that's where it came from. Um, they are the names of our, the first three altars that came from us. So when we were eight years old and green a, a, a series of events happened that formed green to emerge from our psyche he later became known as vincent and then there was also michael and then there was also ash um so uh so like i said this movie was something they were anticipating and developed their identities from and i actually asked i said well, why didn't you guys go by like eric and brandon you know stuff from the first film and their response was well we were the, you know, like, I guess our original, um, he was the first. So they consider themselves like, you know, the next round. Uh, they, you know, they, they're like, yeah, we can't be Brandon or Eric or anything like that because that's who our core personality was to them. 
So they decided to get all hyped up for this movie. So much to their disappointment, because when they said they saw, I was like, well, what'd you think of? Like, I asked Green, I was like, what'd you think of the second Crow then? You know, you guys kind of formed your identities around those names. You know, what did you think of the movie when it came out? And they said they were actually all disappointed. <laughs> so so it's, it doesn't seem like the movie's well loved by anyone in us, inside of us. But they, they learned from this movie that movies get butchered and don't in the in the true vision of a lot of movies don't get released much like a lot of current fans have learned with Snyder Cut and other films like that so they decided to start working in the entertainment industry and that's actually what led us to work in movies and comics and all these things is the, actually the crow this is something i didn't know about us um so i thought that was pretty amazing that uh that this crappy sequel <laughs> meant so much to us and to find the original cut. And so we have all these journals where, you know, the original Sikh, he and these other alters went and worked on movie sets as grips and PAs and all these things. And they would ask people, they went out to California and they would ask people, did you work on the crow city of angels? And every once in a while they would run into someone who did, and they would document it in these journals of who they met and you know, what they contributed to the movie. And all of them said the same thing. The movie that came out, wasn't the movie that was supposed to release. And even they met someone who worked on the reshoots of the movie, and they said Tim Pope, the director, wasn't even a part of the reshoots. And that was something that they had learned while, you know, meeting people in the industry. So, uh, so yeah, that first film really resonated with us. And, and then the second film was something they really hoped would be a home run. And, you know, the fact that they were online too, saying like, you know, in chat room saying, we just don't want to see Eric. Uh, along with other fans, just don't make it Eric Draven, cast a new person and continue the story. And that's why they went with Sarah and continued it. And um, and they said, if you don't make it, Eric, we'll go see your sequel. And people did. Fans did. But unfortunately, they were let down because of you know the movie was originally going to be like a two hour and four minute or something like around that length. And it got cut down to like an hour and 36 minutes, something really ridiculous, uh, all because of Harvey Weinstein and other people involved that uh, wanted the movie to just be more action and less drama, less love story. And uh, and you can tell when you see the movie that there's a lot cut out. Um, but yeah, look, in these, there's such great shots. Like, I think Tim Pope really directed the hell out of this movie. And it shows in these still images. And like I said, I wish we could have got the first series of cards to talk about the first film more and have more of those comparisons. Because no matter what, as I flip through these, we're going to constantly come back to this sequel. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, there's just, there's so much to say about the first film and how amazing it is. And, um, Oh, hold on. I think we got some cards stuck together here. Here we go. Yep. Cause we got our first embossed card. Check that out. All right. The crow is out on the street tonight. And I think this has the artist of uh, uh, Bob Fingerman has put the crow in his natural environment, a dirty decaying urban street at night. Fingerman has been drawing comics professionally since he was 19. You may know his work from cover paintings on doom patrol or read his comic white like she, uh, for dark horse and skinheads in love for fantagraphic. Um, and monkey jank is his comic serial that he made. Very cool. Um, so yeah, we'll put that off to the side. I'll put a little sleeve on it. Why not? But uh, there's 10 of these in the set. And I think we actually have all 10 of them already. Because like I said, I think you get pretty much a whole set, if not most of a set, in a single box. Um, so that's cool. But yeah, the, I mean, but the first film, everything from Brandon's performance to the way it was shot, you know, the dialogue, uh, the, the, the quotes, the one-liners... Um, the action, you know, as minimal as it can be at times, it was really effective. Um, the fight scenes, like it was just cool. And Eric was always meant to be a, an everyman and just like a guy just who wasn't very extraordinary in life. He had a, a job. He, you know, tried to get a band started, um, you know, and trying to, you know, work that scene with music and be an artist. Um, and then Shelly Webster, you know, who was deeply in love with him, who was trying to fight, for this neighborhood that they lived in to, you know, get prevent people from getting evicted because obviously the villains of this city were just, you know, getting people kicked out of their homes and burning places down and all this stuff and had all these like, you know, CD, you know, ties, ties to the, to politics and stuff in their city. And 
it just was a really corrupt town. And, and Shelly was one of those people that was trying to fight against it and Eric by her side. And that was, you know, so they were just everyday people that just believed in a better tomorrow for their community. And, uh, and then they get killed for it in the first film. So it's just a really heart wrenching story. And when you learn the, the backstory of the crow for James Obar and like where the, the idea emerged in some ways from tragedy in his own personal life, it just, this feels like a really tough, you know, story franchise, if you will. Um, it certainly has its, a, a few curses, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Um, it's, uh, it's had a lot of struggles, this franchise. And I think that's going to continue with this remake. I don't think the remake looks that great, but that's just because I don't see a lot of style in this new film. It doesn't look like it has a style. It looks like it apes off of other films, like current action films like John Wick and stuff. And I actually heard people say, well, the original Crow was a comment on action movies of its time, but it wasn't. It wasn't that at all. You don't understand cinema if that's what you actually think. Uh, the Crow was not a, a comment on action films of its time. Um, it was a translation of a comic book that is not for everybody, <laughs> that is very violent and told a, a love story as much as if it told an action story. And it's like this dark opera in a way. And it, and it was different than most of the other films, all of the other films that came out around the time of the first film. This is un wild that we've only gotten this one tattoo <laughs> several times. Uh, that is pretty wild. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think that, I mean, to me, that is not what the first crow is. It is not a comment on action movies at, uh, from the time. It is uh, a great shot of Danny there. It is not that. Um, so uh, it is, it's its own thing. It's, it, it came out at a time where there were a lot of action movies that you could make comments about. But the crow didn't do that. It was rock and roll. It was punk rock. It was violent. It was had love. It had all these elements. Had really good acting in it, um, you know. And it was just one of those movies that stood out from all the action movies of its time. Uh, so to say that it's it was just a comment on it cheapens the film, in my opinion. And when people say, "Oh, well, the the old one was a comment on action films of its time," which, like I said, is not true. And then they'll say, this one's a comment of action films of the current time, which is like John Wick films. And it's like, no, but that's not what The Crow is. It's not a comment on action stories uh, or movies or filmmaking. Uh, it is it is not that at all. That's great there. And that's a great reason, like, because you're like, well, how does he end up with the, you know similar face paint as Brandon Lee had in the first film? Well, that's why you have Sarah. Sarah understands what he is when he comes back from the dead. And she's like, okay, well, if you're going to go out there, this is what I know. Uh, about people like you who come back you have to have some kind of mask in a way um and uh, and i like that there's a scene later in the movie where they explain the concept of masks with day of the dead and a priest explains it to ash's character i think it's really cool i also like that they did motorcycles uh, just to kind of separate the first movie he's running across rooftops in this one he's you know driving a motorcycle around because he's a mechanic uh originally eric draven was a mechanic in the in the comic book but they didn't really translate that to the first film of what his day job was when he wasn't in a band. So they took that job of, of being a mechanic and gave it to Ash in the second one. So yeah, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of great stuff as far as these movies go, in my opinion. Uh, but the, I don't know, the third one I thought had, I can't believe that's, <laughs> that's the only tattoo we're going to get in this whole box. Um, the third one is where I'm like, okay, Barrett uh, Naluri, uh, Barrett Naluri was the director of it. I think he did a good job. Uh, looks like previous us, old Seek, if you want to call him that, and Green and them and Ash, they met Barrett and Lurie and Eric Mabius at a, a Dragon Con in Atlanta where they got to see the film like six months or a year before it actually came out. It was their first screening of a movie ever was The Crow Salvation. Again, something I've learned you know, recently that I really knew. Like I read it in a journal but like to hear it said was was something else um, because it involved all four of the altars in Atlanta having a good time at Dragon Con and meeting Eric Mabius and meeting Barrett and Allure. Um, Just a moment of, you know, for her. Uh, this young lady here, uh, she passed away, unfortunately, not too long after this movie came out. She was um, originally, I think, a Power Ranger. And then was cast in this film, 
very pretty young lady and tragically met her end soon after uh, this film came out, I believe. It sounded like, you know, she was someone who was very nice. Everyone who worked with her said she was amazing and that she was just great to be around. And uh, and it's it's heartbreaking. Um, and I think her name is... I, I don't want to mispronounce her name, so I'll put it on screen there because I, I feel like I've never heard it actually said in a while, so I don't want to mispronounce it. So I'll put it on screen, um, but she plays Callie as her character's name. Um, and she's really cool. She's got, uh, she has a great fight scene with Vincent in this film. Um, and actually this is the scene where I think she gets thrown off the roof, um, <laughs> at, at the end of their fight. Um, so yeah, that's the scene with her there. And just look at these shots. I mean, like, like I said, Tim Boat, Tim really, he really directed this, the hell out of this movie, I feel. He, he had a good look for this film. Um, but yeah, just, uh. Just a moment for that that young lady who was very talented and, you know, another tragic part of the Crow legacy in, in a lot of ways. But, um, and if you want to watch a great video on the Crow, I'm going to put a link to uh, Into the Depths video down below. So please check him out. He's made an amazing video on the Crow franchise um, and, uh, and talks a lot about the comic book especially. So please go give that a shot. Check that out. Amazing, amazing uh, you know, YouTuber and content creator and big fan of the crow like me, uh, for sure. Um, but I, I mean, even bigger than me, I would say the original ones of us are probably the real fans. And I just kind of leached onto that when I found a lot of their collection post aneurysm. Um, but, and then I became a fan of this franchise. Um, particularly the first two, I, I, I defend the second one. I, I won't say it's a great movie, but I see a lot of potential in it now that I know the stories behind this film at least the ones we've heard and you know experienced through other people that were on the set I think there would have been a great film here a great sequel here uh, definitely a better movie for sure the crow salvation Eric Mabius uh, my opinion is that he was uh, he was also a great crow um, I thought he played a great ca a character um, and oh hey look our next embossed cover I think this is a Tim Bradstreet art yeah, Tim Bradstreet depicting Vincent Perez and his stunning cover to the Crow Seed of Angels, number one. When this comic book series came out, which I have all three issues, this comic book series, they did movie covers and drawing covers. Um, so yeah, this is one of the art covers to it, and it's beautiful. Tim Bradstreet, amazing artist in the 90s. Did a lot of great covers like this. Um, awesome. All right, so we're just going to try to speed through the rest of this box. And then, I don't know if I'll open the second one, because we're kind of talking about the movies at the speed I want to, and uh, and we're going pretty long. So let's just try to get through this, and we'll finish talking about The Third Crow, which is Salvation, which, like I said, I think is an okay movie. Um, hey, finally, a different tattoo. <laughs> awesome. Finally, finally. Good, good, good. All right. Um, but the third one, Eric Mabius, I think, like I said, he did a great job. Fred Ward as the villain, that nah, didn't really do much for me. The, the premise was kind of stolen a little bit from a, a, a novel called The Crow, The Lazarus Heart. And in The Lazarus Heart novel, it was about uh, two men who were in love in New Orleans. And one of the men gets killed, and his boyfriend or fiance um, is the one who gets framed for the murder. And then he comes back a year later to solve that murder um, and, and try to you know get to the truth. And that's kind of what the third Crow Salvation is. It kind of pulled from that novel and just changed up the characters and stuff. And they didn't go with a gay couple. They went with, you know, just uh, a guy and a girl again. Um, and I thought they did an okay job. Uh, it was not a good translation of the book, but I don't think it was trying to be. It just took the concept from the book and did its own thing with it. But the book is really, really good. There's the priest that talks to Ash there. And talks about Day of the Dead and masks and everything. Um, but yeah, so there's just, I don't know, there's, there's, um, it wasn't a translation of Lazarus Heart. Because Lazarus Heart, I felt like would have, I think it would have made a better Crow movie in the sense that it, the book by Poppy Z. Bright had a lot of style in it. Um, and style, I think, is something the Crow needs. Barrett and Alluri did an okay job directing the third movie, but I didn't feel like, I mean, it kind of had, a look to it, a unique look, but I wouldn't call it a, I wouldn't call it style per se. Um, 
But he's, from what I hear, he's a great director to work with, and he asked the actors for feedback on a lot of things, and I heard he never really got mad, never raised his voice, was just there to have fun and make a Crow movie and, you know, something he was a fan of, and uh, kind of saw it as like this brooding German opera, kind of dark opera thing. So he had a neat take on the, the universe of The Crow. Um, but sadly, the, there was just too many things that were the same in that. Uh, but I will say one thing that movie did give us that I really liked was Walton Goggins. <laughs> Walton Goggins, who is one of my favorite current day actors, he'll be in the Fallout show coming out soon, and he was on the show The Shield. He's a really great actor, and he was in that movie as, you know, like Thomas Jane was in the second Crow movie. Um, he was in the film as one of the villains to, to be killed by Ash's character. I mean, uh, not Ash in the third film wasn't Ash, but uh, but yeah, Eric Mabius's character. Um so yeah, boom, good shot of the crow. All right, young lady here who is tweaked out on this drug that's going around the city. Um, and then we got another embossed card too. Really awesome. And this one is by Val Merrick. Really cool, did work on Heavy Metal and Howard the Duck. Uh, so this card is called Revenge from Above. Really awesome. So three embossed cards, no chromiums yet, but I think chromiums are only like one or two a box. So, awesome. Okay. Ah, right, look, another new one with the wings. That's cool, because that's actually a tattoo that I believe Sarah has in the movie. And I like that they give these tattoos out. I'm sure I re realized that at the time, that Sarah becomes a tattoo artist. So it's cool that they put these like, you know, fake henna tattoos or whatever, um, disposable tattoos in each pack is awesome. Um, that, that's really cool. So yeah. And then look later on, we, in real life, we got real tattoos. <laughs> so, so I wonder how much of an influence at times this, this franchise clearly had on us. Um, and the third film, like I said, it's, you know, Eric maybe just kind of treats the character as someone who is like a kid with a new toy. But then as soon as he uses the new toy, like, you know, whether he heals from a wound or, you know, or kills a guy or whatever, his grief immediately follows the joy. And he kind of played it like that. And I thought that was interesting because it, it means he's continuously tortured throughout his adventure as someone who's been resurrected. He's like, OK, I got my revenge and I'm having fun killing these guys. But as soon as it happens now, there's a sense of closure, you know, a, a portion of closure. And it makes him remember what he's fighting for. And it hurts. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I, you know, I guess that's true for all the crows in a way. But um, but the way he played it, I thought was really good. Uh, the only crow movie I will not talk in depth about is the fourth one, Wicked Prayer, which is also named at least after one of the novels. There was a crow. There's been six or five or six crow novels, and the, there was one called Wicked Prayer. And now I think the premise is not very much the same. Again, I think the movie just kind of took the name and kind of ran with it. Um, and did it try to do its own thing and maybe pulled a, hints of stuff, but nothing major. But uh, I did not like Wicked Prayer. Edward Furlong, to me, was not a good crow. I think that movie wasn't cast very well. And I love Danny Trejo, and even him I didn't like in the movie. So when you, when you, you, know, when you get me, a Danny Trejo fan, to not even like his performance in a movie, then to me that's really, you know, you didn't do a good job at all. I don't even remember the director's name of the fourth crow. Um... And that's how much I, I paid attention to that film. I've seen it, like, I think I've seen it maybe once, maybe twice. Um, but the second time, I don't think I finished watching it. I was like, oh my god, I forgot how bad this was. Um, so yeah, can't really say much about Wicked Prayer. I do not like that film. We can talk more about any of these movies in the comments, obviously. But um, yeah, not a big fan of Wicked Prayer. Uh, the, the TV show, though, with Mark Dacascos had its moments. I really didn't like that it was... Eric, obviously. I wish they would have done a different character. And then they cram the story of Eric into the first episode, but then Eric stays past his revenge and then, you know, ends up living in Detroit or whatever for a whole year. And during that time, uh, interacts with other people, including other crows. They actually had their uh, female crow on there, uh, like a cop, I think. It wasn't I Iris Shaw from the comics, I don't think, but it was a female crow. And check this out. This is uh, Jean Fama, Scream of the Crow. This is really neat. Um, did an adaptation of Little Shop of Horror comics. Uh, so that's nice. That's awesome. I like hearing the backstory of 
some of these creators and, and artists and things like that. Um, that. I just, it's so cool to see. And sorry, that, that slip was a little bit too big for this. I like the ones that just hug it right on the side. So yeah, cool. So four embossed cards. And look, we still got all these packs left. <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta hurry up. But yeah, the Crows, it was called Stairway to Heaven. It lasted one season. I think TV Guide is the one who released the Blu-ray or DVD of it. It was just a DVD. They didn't, I don't think they put on Blu-ray. Um, but yeah, it wasn't the best. Uh, it's, I mean, it, it had its moments so, though. And I think Mark Dacascos did a good job. And I think that was meant to be a, as like a way to ease fans into a possible remake. Because they were like, well, we, we want to reboot this franchise. They've been wanting to do that for a while. And I think that show was like, all right, well, let's see if fans will accept another Eric Draven. And although people like Mark Dacascos, I feel like mostly fans won't accept another Eric Draven. You would need a many years between the films, like they're doing with the new remake. They have like three decades in between the films. So now a whole new audience can check out Bill Skarsgård as Eric and maybe accept him. And who knows, maybe some of the older fans will ease up and, and accept him. I Me, not so much. I saw the trailer and I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Um, me personally. Um, but, uh, but we'll see. I mean, I'm sure one day on Netflix or something, I'll watch it, but I won't pay to see it in the, in the theaters or anything like that. I'm not going to contribute to, um, to a remake like that. There was a time I also saw in, uh, old Seek's journal that there was a crow movie that was going to be made called Lazarus. And it was going to be about a rapper played by DMX and I don't know how far they got into development of that. I know DMX was a big star in the early 2000s. Wow, is that the same card twice? That's amazing. Of Judah Earl. <laughs> okay. Um, so imagine buying one pack and getting that. I'd be so disappointed. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. So, uh, yeah, the with the remake, though, it's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't get into the, the lack of style and, and another... I'm not anti Eric Draven being recast, I guess. I mean, I would have been willing to accept it. And when I first heard Bill Skarsgård was playing him, I definitely perked up and I said, well, hey, he's a good actor. You know, maybe he will do a good job. But for me, it was the look. And I know you got to go with something different. You don't want to do the exact same or tread on the same ground. But I feel like they, uh, they might have went a little too different in some regards. At least for me as a fan. So... So yeah, I'm not on board with this this new remake. Not, not even a little bit. Especially after I saw the trailer. Like at first when I heard the announcements of who's in it, I was like, okay, I'm interested. And then I saw the trailer and I was like, all right, I'm not interested now. Um, and I know that song on there that has Ozzy on it and Post Malone and stuff. Like, yeah, it's not a bad song. You know, The Crow's always about music and what kind of music you have for it. But I just, uh, I don't know. It's a good song and I understand the meaning of the song could translate to a crow type story for sure but uh i still didn't like it in the trailer like uh the song i took this you know if you take the song separately and listen to it i'm like oh okay but splashing it over like a generic crow remake looking film yeah i, I didn't really dig that um yeah look at that cool shot i mean just a simple shot of her walking into this garage and the way it's lit with this green light and orange light over here like um I don't know, it's just like this movie had a style. Like, look how, look at all that burnt yellow and orange behind them to contrast. Like, the first film, they shot a lot through filters, and they tried to bleed out a lot of color. And they made the film almost look black and white, as black and white as they could get, because that's what they wanted. Like, Brandon Lee and Alex Perez would have loved to make the film in black and white. Um, but because of many, you know, Hollywood filmmaking reasons, they couldn't. So they decided, okay, well, we'll just shoot through filters, and bleed out all the color, and then in the flashback scenes, we'll do a lot of bright Technicolor shots. And this film was a little bit of the opposite. This was this film looked like it had jaundice, <laughs> and I think they were going for that. Uh, I think in the director commentary they said like, there's this yellow look to the film and this fog to it. It just looks like the city is sick, um, like the pollution has gotten so bad because of Judah Earl's drug, you know, cartel and everything that he's literally poisoned the city. And so Ash isn't just a representative of getting revenge for himself, but he's in a way bringing salvation to the city uh, of angels. And I think that's, again, a theme that was in the original cut that didn't make it to the final cut. 
But I liked how they had all this Day of the Dead stuff in there, too. Just really fitting for the crow. Hey, and speaking of, we got another. Oh, that's a great one. Look how punk rock he looks there. Um, that's really cool, I think. Like I said, you can do different looks to the crow. Like his hair and his face paint and stuff like that. Because look at all the artists that have done the same. But there needs to be, like even here, he has the sword. You know, like in the, in the new movie, he's got a sword he's walking around with. Like those things I don't really have a problem with interpretation in general it's just got to be an interpretation that looks like it fits and it's got to have a style to it when you're doing like the crow and blade like movies like that were were a little different than the other films coming out at the times that they came out like blade came out the same summer as batman and robin so big blockbuster comic book movies movies and stuff they look like batman and robin you know they didn't look like blade and they didn't have the action that blade had they had like cheesy action in it and same with the crow there was stuff that came out in the 90s and they were kind of cheesy and goofy, and the crow wasn't. It kind of took its its source material seriously and respectfully. And that's why I think it resonated. That's why it found an audience beyond the comic book pages. Um, and that's what you want. You want to take an indie comic book like like The Crow or Hellboy or you know something like that, and you want to you want it to reach a bigger audience. It won't reach a mass audience, most likely, because of the type of content. But oh. Sorry, the tattoo, which is the same one anyway, <laughs> got stuck in the pack. All right. But yeah, I mean, clearly we hold the, the crow in high regard. Some people might say, you know, we overhype it or, you know, put it up on a pedestal or whatever. But I mean, look, I explained earlier how much impact this franchise in a way has had to us psychologically. So yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense why I would... I would defend it at times. And why I would say the first three Crow movies, I wouldn't have any problems owning the first three Crow movies if they re-released them all on Blu-ray, which they're doing with the first Crow. But if they did City of Angels and Salvation, I'd, I'd probably buy those on Blu-ray too. I don't know how many other people would, but <laughs> but I would. Um, but I, I would never buy Wicked Prayer again. And I probably wouldn't buy Stairway to Heaven. As for the comic books, though, and then, like I said, Lazarus, that was a movie that was going to feature DMX as a rapper who gets killed, who comes back, and uh, and they never got around to making that film either. But that would have been cool, too. Like, you know, that, that could have brought a new style to The Crow. Because uh, each Crow soundtrack, at least the second and third one, had rap songs in them. Um, so, you know, it would have been cool to see something in that setting where it was like the world of hip-hop and how aggressive that was in the 90s where... You know, in late in early 2000s where people were killing each other and stuff. I mean, that could have been something worth exploring with, and it have a very unique style to it. So it's a shame that that one never got made. There was also a Rob Zombie Crow movie called The Crow 2037 that was going to take place in the year 2037. Uh, and it was going to be a little boy who gets killed when he's, you know, he's younger with his mom. And then for some reason he gets resurrected as a kid and then looks for the killer who was like a satanic priest that like killed his mom or something. <laughs> and, uh, and then he spends like, he ends up growing up, uh, you know, as a, as a zombie, I guess in the real world. And then the year 2037, he finally comes face to face with that priest again and tries to kill him. And even that's different. Like I, <laughs> that's so different than what was in the other movies. And I, I don't know. And that was going to be written and directed by Rob Zombie. So who knows? It could have been good or it could have been as bad as his Halloween, you know, remakes. Who knows? But this, look at that. Our first chromium, which I love the play on words there. And is this Iris Shaw? This is Iris Shaw, the return of Iris Shaw. Card five of six. A woman brought back from the dead by the crow exacts a terrible judgment on her murderers, the band of right-wing terrorists who killed her and her unborn child. Uh, so for people out there who don't like their politics and their comic books, um, just more proof that this stuff's always kind of been in there to some degree. And uh, and so, yeah, there's right-wing terrorists here who killed her. And her, she was pregnant at the time. She was a cop. And they killed her. Um, and she comes back. Uh, the first female crow tightens a circle around the terrorist ringleader, all the while eluding the authorities called in to investigate her death. So, yeah, there are people investigating how she died, much like the first crow movie had uh, with uh, Detective Albrecht. Um, but then she's in this book called The Crow, Flesh and Blood, She's running around avoiding them, kind of like Batman style, where she's staying out of the way of the cops and also trying to get her revenge and kill the people who took her out. So beautiful shot. I mean, just awesome, awesome art. 
uh, Alexander Maliev uh, did the comic book, and James Vance was the writer. I don't know if it says the artist's name for this card, though. Oh, this is James O'Barr's cover. Ah, right, okay. I was wondering, because the face looked similar to uh, how he draws Shelley Webster. So, that's cool, though. Our first chromium. I dig it. All right, so now we got all these packs left. <laughs> Let's blaze through them. Comic books, there was Flesh and Blood. There was Wild Justice. You know, there was the Crow comic went from Caliber Comics, and then the rights went to Kitchen Sink, and then it went. It bounced all over the place. Image Comics, for a while, had the rights to the Crow. They're the ones who make Spawn and all that stuff, and Walking Dead, uh, well, through Skybound, I guess. But, but the Crow lasted, like, I think 10 issues over at Image before it got canceled, and... It's just one of those franchises that just kind of bounce around. I think currently it has, IDW has the rights, and IDW will release a miniseries every now and again. And I'll be honest with you, even though James Obar, uh, even though James Obar wrote one of the comics for IDW, one or two of them, I, I haven't really liked any of the IDW Crow comics, um, especially the one where the Crow meets Hack Slash. I thought that was uh, just goofy. I think Tim Seeley or someone did that one. And that was just, in my opinion, just terrible. Just, uh, yeah, I didn't really dig that. So I haven't really loved the IDW stuff. So I don't own any of it. I mean, I've read them. Uh, and then after I bought them when they came out. And then I, whenever I sold a comic collection, I would slip those in there and be like, look, you don't have to give me anything for them. Just take them off my hands because I just don't want them in my collection. Um, so, yeah, I haven't really loved a lot of that stuff. But the James Obar original book, um, the Shattered Lives and Broken Dreams novel, the Hellbound novel, Lazarus, uh, Heart. Um, th there's been so many great novels and, and st extensions of The Crow that I've liked um, that, uh, that those are great. But sadly, the, um, the other stuff I haven't really loved past, past that time period. So pretty much all the IDW stuff and a lot of the current stuff that they put out still sometimes I don't love. But check this out. Oh my God, that's so great. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is, okay, Dean Rohrer, uh, Wallywood worshiper Dean Rohrer. Yeah, he has a Wallywood style. Uh, he brings a classic comic book look to The Crow in his version. He's drawn stuff like Weird Business and Duplex Planet Illustrated. Um, so, yeah, really cool. Pensive Crow looks out over the crow-studded cornfield. Pretty neat. Yeah, a crow in a cornfield and, like, a scarecrow thing. That's, I like, playing with that imagery is cool, too. They did a little bit of that in the first film. They, there's a shot with uh, Shelly and Eric out in the field it looks really nice um it's a cool looking contrast shot to the rest of the movie so yes um yeah big fan of playing with the looks of things and playing with contrast in the crow is is really awesome when you read that first book by james obar it's amazing because it's it's poetry it's artwork it's not it has a a linear story to an extent but it also bounces around a little bit it gets interrupted by song lyrics and random pieces of artwork that break up the story um it's kind of jumbled but it makes sense because if you're looking through this through eric's point of view in the first comic um look at that another double <laughs> uh if you're looking through you know if you're seeing it through the world of the eyes of eric draven it makes sense um that it would be jumbled because this is the guy who's trying to piece his mind back together while also knowing exactly that he has to get revenge in the comic, from page one, he's like, all right, I know what I got to do. In the movie, because it's a movie, you, you can't really have that. You got to build towards it at least a little bit. And the movie, I think the first film does it, did that really well, where it translated the comic and the spirit of it while also telling it in a different way, but still staying faithful. And uh, and, and they they really did. Like Brandon and Alex Proyas and the art team and the set designers, everyone kept saying, like, we really want to just preserve what's there in the comic because that's what makes it cool and rock and roll. And then we just want to adjust it a little bit because, you know, uh, we're making a film and we just want to bring it to life in a different way, but we still want to stay faithful to it. And that's, uh, that's the key to any adaptation, whether you're a fan of the franchise or not. I mean, Alex Proyas and Brandon Lee, they were like, you know, I think they read the comics when they got the job and were interested in the job, but before then they weren't fan fans of it. Mo most people weren't fans. Most people didn't hear of the comic. So that, so when people say, oh, you never heard of, you know, Star Wars and you're writing Star Wars, you've never seen a Star Wars movie and you're writing Star Wars, it's like, yeah, I know that's a little different, but sometimes you don't always need someone who's a hardcore fan, in my personal opinion. As someone who's written and created, created things too, 
I've translated stuff and I've written scripts for stuff that I'm like, well, I know there's original material to this and I want to do my research and learn about it and be as respectful as I can. But I also like, you know, I'm being hired to do something to where I'm supposed to bring it to a, you know, a new light, you know, add something to it and not just do a one to one translation. Um, Cause then I would just be copying. And as an artist, I would feel awful just copying someone's work uh, in that regard. So yeah, so I think there's a good balance, and I think the first Crow movie nails that, ba that balance really well. So, oh, okay. So, yeah, some of these cards are sticking together, but some some look like they are and some aren't. That's a great shot of Vincent there. That's from the end of the film. Even though it's kind of a goofy moment where he just kind of summons all these crows and they fly through him to go kill Judah, it's an okay moment, but it's just the effect on Judah when he gets picked apart. It should have been like his flesh ripping off. And so I wonder if that would have made it an NC-17 rating or something, because he just turns into, like, a blob and disappears, and it's so weird-looking. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. I am a fan of Iggy Pop, though. If you watch the behind-the-scenes of The Crow, City of Angels, he'll tell you that he really liked working with Tim Pope, because Tim Pope, he feels, made him um, made him an actor. He was like, you know, I, he's like, before I've been in certain movies and played small parts, he goes, but I never really acted. And he goes, and this is the first movie I acted in, and he goes, and Tim Pope taught me how to act. And I think Iggy Pop is a, a standout in this. Like the other villains, even though Thomas Jane's in there and they have other great villains and Callie and everything, like uh, they they're all great. But um, I think Iggy Pop's even cooler than than the, uh, Brooks, the the gentleman who plays Judah Earl, the main villain. Um, I think uh, Iggy Pop s stands out even above his performance. Uh, so yeah, and there's Iggy on the motorcycle there. Iggy's just fantastic, and I, I think. I like what, um, oh, hold on, there's another card. Oh, look at that. Another embossed. Sweet. All right, we'll do a, a box revisit at the end. Danielle Zazelge. Uh, sorry if I'm butchering your name. I apologize. Um, Danielle has done comic books in Italy, uh, the, the Rhythm of the Heart, Sun City, Sophia, and Rex. And his 400-page story, Geronimo X. That's cool. This is card 7 of 10. Really awesome looking. A Crow pop art production. So yeah, he did like a pop art style to the Crow. And that's what I like too, is that they, they do different actual styles in these images. So it's not just like, oh, it's a comic book style. It's like, no, we're, we're going to do pop art. We're going to do uh, propaganda art. You know, we're going to do all this different styles of stuff. It's, it's fantastic. And you can get away with that in The Crow because The Crow is about style, in my opinion. It, it's about the look of it as much as is the story um, and the visceral you know, imagery is what kind of pulls you in and how raw it feels. Um, it's art, you know, it, it's in, in its the, in the form it's meant to be in. <laughs> Great shot of Mia Kirshner. Beautiful. And there's her painting. So this is cool. The one running theme in the movie. She's painting this one painting throughout the whole film. And then in the end you find out she's painting her own death scene. Uh, which is uh, just just the most heartbreaking thing ever. Um, but done effectively. I heard even more effectively though in the Tim Pope cut. I heard that was going to have a bigger impact in that film. It was more of a dramatic ending, and that's why Harvey Weinstein didn't want it in this cut, unfortunately. Um, there's Iggy Pop when he's dead. His crotch is on fire. He's got a piece of a motorcycle stuck in his stomach. Oh, I found something else interesting. This scene here where he's, like, driving the motorcycle and fighting Ash, apparently, and he puts the coin in his mouth, apparently that scene was shown on a wrestling thing, like a, uh, a W... I don't know, one of the other ones, WCW or something like that. I found that out and I was listening to the, the, that story being told where they were staying up to watch wrestling, which wasn't something I guess we liked that much as a kid, but our little brother did. And we saw an advertisement that, hey, if you watch, you know, Monday night, whatever, you know, you'll see a scene from the new Crow movie. And that was a way that they advertised the film to, you know, people, you know, general public people, people who are watching wrestling. So, uh, and I think one of the wrestlers at that time had crow face paint as well. So, hey, finally another piece of art on the tattoos, finally. All right, so we're getting near the end. we got one more stack left. So we'll probably just stick to one box in this video because I feel like we've done enough. And the other one I'll just open some other way, maybe for fun. Um, or I'll give it to Blue to open if he wants to go through it. I don't think he's that big of a crow fan, though. But, um, but he does like cards, so... 
we'll see. We'll see what we do with it. Um, but at least the hits on the, the other box, I'll share them on social media with you guys. Yeah, so let's see. We covered the show a little bit. We talked about the movies. We talked about the comic books. Uh, we talked about this film and how there's a better cut of it out there somewhere. Probably lost now at this point. Who knows? Um, but, uh, but yeah, just a franchise that actually matters to us more than I, even I thought. I was like, oh, yeah, it's cool. It's a cool franchise. It's it's neat. Um, and I saw the journal entries of, you know, old Seek asking about all the different, you know, asking people he worked with, like, about if they worked on City of Angels or not. And I was blown away. And then even there was this one day I saw someone wearing a Crow City of Angels crew jacket when I worked at Lego. And I thought, oh, my God, I get, I'm going to ask them. I'm going to kind of continue old Seek's, like, mission and I asked this lady who uh, who was in, who came in the store, and I said, "Did you work on that film?" She goes, "Yeah." I said, "That's a that's so great that you're wearing that jacket, especially in L.A. I think it was like summertime too." I was like, "Why are you wearing that jacket?" Um, but uh, but I'm glad she did because it, it started a conversation between us, and I discovered that she worked on the film, and she even said she was like, "It was heartbreaking." She goes, "I wasn't, I was part of Tim Pope's you know close unit filming the movie." And she's like, and I, I didn't, uh, I didn't come back for the reshoots because when I heard that they didn't hire Tim back and they just got some random, you know, person to come in and, you know, do a bunch of the reshoots, she's like, I, when I heard it wasn't Tim coming back, I was like, I don't want to be there. She's like, so a lot of us original crew members didn't come back on the reshoots either, and that loyalty is just like, oh man. I, so I went and added it to one of Seek's uh, old Seek's journals. And uh, cause I thought it was my journal, you know, like I thought it was me without the memories. Um, so I put it back in there just to have it in. And now that I realize what's really going on with us and our, our mentally and stuff is that I was like, well, I'm, I'm even more glad I added it. Cause I feel like I added a little chapter to his book, uh, his, his journey of finding answers about this film. All right. So we got about seven packs left. And we're almost an hour in. So yeah, like I said, we're we're not even going to bother opening this other box on video. I think I've said everything I need to say about this franchise. Um, for the most part, we can continue in the comments, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, and then the remake coming out, like I said, I, I just, all I saw was the one trailer. And I'm, I'm already over it. Uh, this is Holly Days is the name of her character. Uh, she's someone who strips for our Thomas Jane character here. Uh, and who plays Nemo, and then there's Spider Monkey, and Callie, uh, and then Iggy Pop's character, who I'm I'm blanking on his name right now. Judah Earl is the the main one. Um, so when we come across another Iggy image, I'll uh, I'll see what his name is. <laughs> I'm I'm blanking right now, and I feel bad. Um, oh, and then boom, there's where they're in the bar. It's like an S and M bar. Yep, awesome. All right, cool. A couple more packs left. But I'll, you know, if you're at wanting to know if I'm going to do a review of the new movie, I will not be. Um, I will when it comes out on, you know, a streaming service where I'm not paying extra to watch it. Uh, I'll, I'll watch it then. But that's how much I dislike the, the trailer. Uh, and some people say, oh, you can't really tell everything by a trailer. You should still... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't care. <laughs> I'm allowed to have an opinion. That's what trailers are for. When you release a trailer, it's to so that people can start formulate formulating an opinion on whether they want to see your movie or not. And that trailer told me not to go see that movie. So uh, at least not pay for it in a theater and pay twenty bucks, thirty bucks to see it uh, on rental either. So yeah, Judah Earl. So I, I'm blanking on this girl's name too. The Sybil. She, uh, Sybil is the blind lady that Judah keeps trapped in his tower. And she sees visions and she kind of feeds him basically exposition in the movie. Um, so she's a source of exposition, which is a shame because there's not really a character there. But this is the only moment where she kind of feels like a character because she actually helps Sarah. But does she really? Because she knows by releasing Sarah to save Ash, it's just going to let Sarah die. So, you know, I guess she's a, a creature of fate. So she everyone everyone has their role to play, I guess, in her mind. But there's not much of a character there, but I think there was more of one when, you know, in the Tim Pope cut of the film. Yeah, all right. 
Oh, looks like we got another embossed, so that's cool. All right, another tattoo. Here we go. Curve, that's his name. I, you know what? I just, the curve of the bike made me think of it. I was like, oh, that's, that, that's a nice shine on that curve on the bike. And that's what reminded me of his name. His name is Curve. Curve rides to the prawn shop. All right, that's what we got to say. <laughs> He's going to the prawn shop. So there you go. And then here's a great shot of all the villains, um, Judah Earl there, who the gentleman who plays him, I, I keep blanking on his name. I know his last name is Brooks, I believe. Uh, he's a good actor. Don't get me wrong. I've seen him in other stuff and he's fantastic. But I just, I didn't know. I don't, I didn't really dig him as Judah Earl. I thought Judah Earl was just animated in the weirdest ways in this. And he was kind of inconsistent at times too. He was someone who didn't take his own product yet at times acted like a complete crackhead. Uh, so, uh, you know, towards the end, especially when he got all the power and I just like, I don't know. It just, uh, I know there's a story reason for it probably. And maybe it plays out better in the extended cut, but it, it just seems out of nowhere in this cut, and I didn't really dig it that much. Um, but yeah, there's Curve enjoying drugs and dancing and people and all kind of stuff. And then, bang, look at that, a Kelly Jones. I recognize Kelly Jones art anywhere. Check that out. Kelly Jones, up from the depths. Uh, that's cool. Shout out to Into the Depths, <laughs> our friend who, again, I'm going to put a link down below to his Crow video, so you can check it out if you'd like. Um Kelly Jones up from the depths. Very cool. Has done work on Batman, Aliens, all kind of stuff. Dead Man, you name it. Uh, Venom, The Madness, my, one of my favorite Venom miniseries from the 90s. So, all right, four packs left. Let's get it. This has gone on way long enough. Uh, and we've talked a lot about Crow stuff. So, again, any opinions about the first movie, second movie, third, fourth, um, Lazarus, you know, 2037, the Jason Momoa remake that was almost made that didn't happen, the current remake that's about to come out, the TV show, all the comic books, the novels. Have you read Hellbound? Hellbound's an interesting novel. In Shattered Lives and Broken Dreams, they do like a, a preview chapter of Hellbound, technically, where they introduce a character named Dren and this angel and demon. And then you go over to Hellbound and read that novel and that is literally about a guy on Earth named Dren who's getting caught up with the wrong people and an angel or an, a demon in hell that's trying to escape hell. And the two of them work together and call on the power of the crow. And uh, and then they you know work together to take down Satan and this crime boss. <laughs> it's uh, quite quite the book. And actually, the crow doesn't even come in till over halfway through the book. So uh, just really awesome uh, story though. I felt. And uh, could also make a good movie because there'd be a lot of style to it, but it would be big budget because you'd have to do the hell stuff. Um, but yeah, so we got Ash there. There is a chromium at the bottom of this. So that's I'm trying to hide it, but I'm sure you saw it. And it's great because I think it's James Obar artwork. And actually, I think we have uh, an original print of this artwork that you're going to see in chromium too, somewhere in our collection. So we'll we'll show that off here in a second. Um, not the artwork that's buried somewhere in our closet, but here's our chromium. Boom! This was one of the covers of the James Obar Crow comic. Look how amazing that is! These chromiums are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So this is from Dead Time Number One. Joshua and his family are killed by a band of renegade soldiers in the late 1860s, and in 1996, Joshua's revenge begins. Obar, the creator of The Crow, is joined by John Wagner from Judge Dredd and Alexander Maliev, Alex Maliev, amazing artist, um, in the first new Crow comic since Obar's original. So this is the first time, Dead Time, uh, this is the, the, the cover of issue one. This is the first time they did another Crow book. So when the first movie was being made, they were like, hey, we got to put more Crow merchandise and, and stuff out there. So they reprinted the first comic book, and then they were like, James Obar, could you make more Crow stories? And he did, and he started with Dead Time. And like I said, Dead Time is the story of Joshua, who dies in the 1860s, but doesn't come back till 1996. So there's, again, changing the rules. I think James Obar never really had a set rule set that you have to follow for a crow. You know, you don't have to be someone who dies and comes back a year later. You can come back the, the same night if you want. You can come back 100 years later. Like, I think it doesn't really matter. It just it, all that matters is what, I guess, fate or afterlife determines would balance the scale of your death 
you know, like, uh, so whenever something really tragic happens to you, who knows, maybe the people who killed you die two days later and you don't get a chance to come back and get them, but there's, they'll be reincarnated in some way a hundred years from now. And then you come back to kill their reincarnation or something like, I mean, there's no real rules to it. Um, just the rules that were in the first one, but not rules that you have to stick to for every crow story from what I understand. Um, so that just gives you a lot of creative freedom to do things there. And yet I still feel like everyone falls onto the same formula of just die and come back, you know, a year later or something, except for, I think the third, third crow salvation, I think he comes back the same night he dies, he gets electrocuted and they put him in the morgue and then he comes back that night. So that's a little different. And then Ash possibly, I think comes back as well, um, very soon after he dies. Cause otherwise him and his son's bodies would have decayed <laughs> way down there. So, so, I mean, Eric Draven's body you can make that argument. He could have decayed in the year he was buried underground. But uh, I think they make a point in the novel to like say that his bones and his flesh rebuild themselves um, and, and reform. Uh, so that way he, you know, he doesn't look like a skeleton when he comes back. Um, but again, I mean, it's fantasy in a way, so you can kind of get away with it. It can, it can, as my friend, uh, uh, Dave film junkie would say, you can make it make sense. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but there's also no set rule, I feel, that you have to follow. And then just a cool shot of the crow itself, which I think they used ravens, like trained ravens in the movies. So I know some people comment on that, like, oh, I don't think that's an actual crow. I don't think it is most of the time either. Uh, I think a lot of times they use trained ravens. Um, just, you know, easier to, uh, to train, I guess. Um, still not easy to train, I'm sure, but I think easier than training a crow. Crows, though, have great memories. So if you... Uh, you know, if you like feed one and it's really hungry, it will remember that. And it might even just live out, outside your house forever. <laughs> and, and it might follow you if you move somewhere to another state. If it's a, if it's a climate that the bird can handle, it might follow you. Um, yeah, crows are like that. They're, they're very loyal in that regard um, and smart. So, yeah, last pack. What are we going to get? Hopefully, hopefully a hit of some kind. Um, cool i noticed this too the way they do these cards like this is all from one scene of the movie like right here just boom 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 all three it says stun back there um this is all the same location and same shot and actually let me see if uh so this is card 60 card 58 card 57 yeah and then oh, hold on two cards stuck together oh we did get a hit and then card 61 so look at that. And I like that the backs of the cards are different. Like they didn't go for, the only thing uniform is the trim and that little box. Um, and then like what they put front and, you know, and, and back and stuff. Um, that's the, oh, hold on. And 59. So look at that. 57, 58, 59, 60, and 61. And I noticed that was like that with most of these packs is you would get cards in order from one scene of the movie. Um, so I wonder if that's how they map these boxes is by scene and maybe certain scenes get certain hits in them or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's pretty neat. But I like that they're a little different on, on the backs of some of these different colors. And that's a lot of you know time and effort to put into design to not make them completely uniform. Um, and I, I, I thank them for that because it makes the card stand out. They did that for the first Crow movie set as well. But check this shot out. Boom. I did it upside down. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. The Crow flying into... Los Angeles. This is actually concept art for the movie, I believe. Uh, yeah, production art. Um, the Lone Crow Flies Over the City, card 10 of 10. So real quick before we go, because this has been a very, very long video. <laughs> so thank you for those who stuck it out with us and talked the crow with us and everything. I really appreciate it. We didn't really get that many different tattoos. I think we got like three or four different designs on those. So I'm sorry, I, didn't, I should have saved some of them. Um, but uh, but you saw them as we went through. For the embossed stuff, though, we got one, two. We got a chromium there. Three, four, five. Second chromium. Six, seven, eight, nine. So check that. There's only ten in the set. And we got nine in one box. Which means the next box is just going to be a bunch of duplicates anyway. So maybe it's a good thing we only did one box in this video. And then I can just either me or Blue open that privately and see if we get any extra chromiums. Um, but yeah, this is, that's amazing. Like you can almost get a whole run of the embossed cards in one box. So for people who collect inserts and stuff, like I said, these were only 20 bucks each, these boxes. So 
kind of a cool, really good deal, actually. Even if, uh, I don't know, I mean, if you're not a fan of the movie, I guess it's it's a waste of money. But to me, I like the movie enough to where this was worth talking about. And we got to talk a little bit about our diagnosis, our condition. Um, we got to talk about the franchise in general, what it actually meant to us um, as like gothy, young, angsty teenagers when this came out. Um, you know, it's it's wild. And to hear all the, the new information that I've been getting from it has been quite amazing too. So I'm really happy that we got to go down this lane with you guys today and, and talk about all this. So let me know your thoughts on the Crow franchise, remake, you know, TV show, comic books, all the movies, anything. I'd love to keep, just keep talking down below. Pope Cut, you know, are you one of the people out there that pushes for that? If so, let me know and I'll definitely share your channel on my community tab or something. Um, it's, I know I'm not as active as a member in that as a lot of you are. And I think it's because I, at some point, it wasn't my fight to, to go for that. It was our previous version of us. And I try to continue it a little bit, but I just don't have the passion that they clearly had. But I still wanted to make at least this video to talk about it and to let people know that there is actually a better cut of this film, this City of Angels movie, out there somewhere. And even though it probably was not going to be as good as the first one, the fact that it was better than what we got is really all that matters. Um because I think the filmmakers and everyone who worked so hard on the second one deserve to have that vision shown at some point. So hopefully it will. But until then, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it so much. Thanks. Uh, leave your comments down below. and We'll keep talking about The Crow down there. See you in the future. Peace.